Okay, um, good afternoon, thanks for coming. Um, yeah, welcome to this year's uh, Philosophy Forum. Um, it is my great pleasure to welcome and introduce our guest, Professor Maria Schechtman. Uh, Maria Schechtman is Professor of Philosophy at the University of Illinois at Chicago. Uh, she joined the USC philosophy department after completing her graduate studies at Harvard University. Uh, Professor Schechtman publishes uh, on a wide variety of topics, particularly personal identity, bioethics, and practical reasoning. Uh, her work has appeared in uh, a couple of prestigious journals. Um, among these are the Journal of Philosophy, the American Philosophical Quarterly, and philosophical studies, to name just a few of them. Uh, Professor Schechtman has also contributed to a large number of anthologies and published two important monographs on the topic of personal identity. The Constitution of Selves was published by Cornell uh, University Press, and the book that the philosophy department studied in preparation for this year's forum and that we will discuss in the workshops is entitled uh, Staying Alive, which was published in 2014 at Oxford University Press. And the title of Professor Schechtman's lecture today is The Way We Were, How Memory Makes Us Who and What We Are. Uh, so please welcome Professor Maria Schechtman. Thank you so much. Thanks for the introduction. Thank you for the invitation. And thanks to all of you for being here um, on a winter afternoon. So I'm going to talk today about memory and identity in sort of general terms. And I'm going to be thinking about a, a particular case um, study that, that I think is really interesting and can really illuminate a lot of the connections. So. One of the things that, that you hear people say a lot is that our memories make us who we are. And you can find this in all kinds of august uh, sources like Inside Out, the recent Disney film, right, where she has core memories that make her who she is. And something sounds right about this claim. There seems to be something in it. But it's not really clear what exactly it means. I think that the idea behind it is roughly that we humans have identities of a particular kind. And that is identities that are connected in some way, I'm keeping things pretty vague to begin with, to a special kind of ethical or emotional significance or depth that we associate with a human life. So, I mean, this gets figured different ways in philosophy, but we humans have plans and projects and relationships and attachments, our lives are somehow uh, fraught with meaning, we're capable of moral agency and of expressing ourselves in myriad ways. And um, memory, I think, in the saying that memory makes us who we are, is taken to be part of this kind of identity, providing us with the means of becoming and expressing individual persons, human persons in this way. Um, but the question that I want to explore today is just how it does this. What's the connection between memory and identity? And this is not a simple question, and I certainly don't think it has a single answer. There are all different kinds of memory, and they contribute to identity. There are also many conceptions of identity, and different kinds of memory contribute to identity in different ways. So I don't think that you know I can give you the answer to how memory uh, is connected to identity. But I do want to look at what I think is a really interesting strand of this question. So I'm going to look at some of the more fundamental ways, I think, in my estimation, in which memory contributes to identity. And the way in which it makes us not just who we are as individuals, but at an even more basic level, what we are, in the sense how memory makes us the kinds of beings that have identities of the sort just described and the kinds of beings who care about these identities and ask questions about them and so on. So before considering exactly how memory does this, I will not tell you actually exactly how memory does it. I'll say some stuff about how I think memory does it. Um, it's going to be helpful to narrow the question down a bit by considering what kind of memory I'm talking about. Because 
as many of you all know, there are many, well, as anybody who remembers things knows, there's, there are lots of different kinds of memory. There's procedural memory, there's remembering how to do something, how to play something on the piano. Um, there's short-term memory, long-term memory, working memory, there are all kinds of memory. And I think all of them undoubtedly contribute in various ways to our ability to lead the kinds of lives we do. But I think that if you know we're talking about this sort of general sentiment that memory is somehow crucial to identity, it's probably safe to say that it's going to be autobiographical memories that are the most important. That is, memories of events in our own histories, memories of our own life. And I'm just hoping that this seems plausible to people. But there's a further question to be asked, because I remember a lot of things about my life but I also remember a lot of things about the lives of other people. So I know where I went to school and where I live and work and whether I'm married or have children. But, and knowing all that is certainly important to my having a sense of identity and being able to live my life and engage in the projects and relationships that make me who I am. If I didn't know that stuff about myself, as sometimes people don't when they have memory deficits, it becomes very difficult um, to live your life. But if I'm a big enough fan, I might also know these kinds of facts about my favorite musicians or athletes or actors or philosophers, right? Knowing every detail of their life that I've studied. And I also remember a great deal of the biography of people I've known for a long time, friends and family. And that doesn't make me identical to any of those people, right? It might tell me something about their identity, but not about mine. So one thing we can learn from this, I mean, you might not, this might seem unnecessary to say, but that um, it's not just remembering facts about someone's biography that makes me that person, right? That alone isn't enough. So what's the difference? Well, the relevant difference is the way I remember events in my own life as opposed to the way I remember those in the lives of others. So I may know where Abraham Lincoln was born and who he married and where he lived and what he did, but that doesn't make me Abraham Lincoln and has little to do with my sense of who I am. So what's the difference between the way I remember Abraham Lincoln's life and my own? Well, there seem to be two important differences um, that are relevant here. First and most immediate, I take memories of my own life to be about my own life, right? I think of them as, I recognize them as memories about my own life, and that's certainly important. But a second important difference um, is that I can remember events in my own life from the inside. I don't do this with all events in my life, but I can remember some from the inside. That is, I remember how things appeared to me and how I felt when whatever it is I'm remembering happened. Now, whatever this remembering from the inside is, there's agreement, it's not just replaying a video, but somehow memories of my own life can come with imagery and emotion and affect, right? And that's very different. So there's two kinds of memory here, and this distinction is made in psychology as a distinction between episodic and semantic memory. So semantic memory is memory of propositions and facts, and I can have semantic memory about my own life. So I remember that I was born in Illinois. I don't remember being born in Illinois. I don't remember being born at all. I remember that I was born in Illinois in very much the same way that I remember that Abraham Lincoln was, or that, you know, I looked this up for a, as an example once. Glenn Miller was born in Clorinda, Iowa, and so I all remember that too. Um, but episodic memory is memory that I can only have of my own life. I mean, there, there's some complications there which we can discuss if people want to, but roughly it's memory I can only have of my own life and it's memory that comes with affect and emotion and imagery. So while I can remember that I was born in Illinois, I can simply remember as opposed to remembering that um, I can remember my first day of teaching, or when my son was little, or I remember getting on the plane this morning to come here, and what it was like at O'Hare, and what it was like when I got off, and so on. So these memories aren't propositions about the past. They're what Endel Tulving, uh, who did early work on this, has called a form of mental time travel, in which we uh, revisit past events. And also, according to, you know, back to the point that I take memories of my own life to be about me, this kind of memory includes always a, what 
Tolving calls an autonoetic sense, or what psych psychologists call an autonoetic sense, the sense that it is myself who is involved in the memory, that this is something that happened to me. Now, there's controversy over whether any other animals have episodic memory besides humans. Some people say yes, some people say no. I tend to think they probably do. But there is general agreement that if not unique to humans, this is a pretty rare form of memory. Now, I think it seems pretty clear that episodic memory should be especially important for constituting an identity because this kind of memory gives me an experience of myself in the past. It lets me know not just what happened to me, but how things were for me, how I felt, how I was in the past. And it's a kind of relation to my own past that I can't have to the pasts of others. So it seems that episodic memory should be essential to living a life with the kind of ethical and emotional depth that gives us identities in the sense that I'm talking about here. A life without episodic memory would surely be a very different kind of life than the life we lead. And I mean, that requires more argument than I can give it here, but just take a minute to think about how much you value your memories and how much people in general value their memories, how much people reminisce, how much scrapbooking there is, right? How much people snap things on their phones and go over them again. These are things we cherish and that seem central to who we are. So it would seem a pretty good bet that episodic memory is somehow front and center to being, you know, having a personal identity in the kind of sense we're thinking about here. But philosophers are learning slowly but surely that it's dangerous to rely on introspection alone to determine what's psychologically necessary and what isn't. Um, and actually there seems to be a real life case which indicates that episodic memory might be a great deal less important to constituting our identities than we would have thought. And this case involves a newly discovered syndrome called severely deficient autobiographical memory syndrome. And before saying a little bit about this syndrome, I want to offer a caveat, which is this. It's a really new phenomenon. They now have identified about five or six cases. It's just being studied. And in going over this case and taking it as the basis for my discussion, I'm focusing on a qualitative uh, description of one of the cases which was presented in the uh, psychological journal Wired Magazine. So it's really not, I mean, one has to be careful um, in putting too much weight on this as a understood psychological phenomenon. But still, it's very thought-provoking, and there's a lot of detail there, and I think it provides an interesting new perspective and a good jumping-off point for some reflections on memory and identity. So the case that's profiled in the article is that of Susie McKinnon. I think they use her real name, as far as I can tell. Ms. McKinnon cannot and never could remember from the inside with imagery or affect any particular experience in her life. And she also, as it turns out, has difficulty imagining specific future experiences. If you say, hey, imagine you're on a beach and you have a you know, pina colada or something, she just really can't do it. But her deficit seems to be restricted, her memory deficit at least, only to episodic memory. Her semantic memory is perfectly intact. Usually people who have memory problems are gonna have problems with both. And she has ordinary, very good knowledge of her own personal history. And what's remarkable about her life is how unremarkable it is. The lack of episodic memory seems to have very little effect on her. She's in a decades-long and apparently very happy marriage. She has a job she enjoys, friends she's had since childhood. She has pursuits she finds meaningful. She sings with a choir and is very interested in music. And this is all true despite the fact that she cannot remember in this episodic way meeting her husband or their wedding day or a single date or a single time together. They take cruises every year apparently. She knows that they take cruises every year. She can tell you that they take cruises, but she doesn't remember a single one uh, in this other sense. She can't remember her first day or any subsequent day of her job or any of the time she spent with her friends or a rehearsal or performance with the choir. You know, they show her a videotape of her performance with the choir and she's like, oh, that's cool. <laughs> I guess I was nervous. I look a little nervous, something like that, but she has no access to it. Despite all of this, which seems like a pretty, you know, distinct difference from, from a lot of people, no one noticed that Ms. McKinnon had this this problem at all until she was in her 20s. 
And a friend who was studying to be a nurse practitioner asked if she could do a practice memory test on her. And when she did it, she said, you need to go see a neurologist. There's something really wrong here. But despite all of this, right, not only does Ms. McKinnon function perfectly well, she has well-defined moral views. She's a white woman from a conservative Catholic family who left the church and later married an African-American man against her family's wishes. She has clear ideas about social justice and about right and wrong that are expressed in her life in the same basic variety of ways that they are in the lives of those who do have episodic memory. And so overall, she seems to provide a striking counterexample to the idea that you might need episodic memory to lead an ethically, emotionally meaningful, full human life or to have a fully developed identity. Now, I found this case really shocking when I first uh, became aware of it. And I find that many other people find it shocking as well because my first thoughts were something like this. I mean, how strange would it be to know that you are married to this man, but not remember ever having been with him before. I mean, that would be really strange. I mean, this is my husband, I know that, so I guess I go home with him, but I mean, you don't remember being with him before. Or, I mean, how could she have the sort of home sweet home feeling you get when you're at home if she didn't remember ever having been, right, uh, at her, in her house before? So it seemed to me very puzzling. I mean, I really just couldn't figure out what it would be like for her. Uh, but when I reflected on the case a little more, I realized maybe I shouldn't have been as surprised as I was initially, because after all, you know, when I see people I love, my family, my friends, I don't have to stop and remember a time I was with them before I know how I feel about them. I have that reaction to them the minute I see them just because of our history together without having to, you know, remember occasions. And after a, you know, terrible day at work when I pull into the driveway and I say, hey, I'm home, right? I don't have to remember last, you know, Thanksgiving at home or something in order to feel the relief of being at home. I just feel it. And it's clearly obvious that animals who are presumed not to have episodic memory, for instance, dogs, for anybody who's ever lived with a dog, can have perfectly clear and well-developed relationships to and feelings about people and places without episodic memory. So this reflection made me think that undoubtedly a great deal of what drives these feelings and connections in our own life that I had presumed was importantly connected to episodic memory since we seem to spend so much time going over these memories. I mean, popular songs are you know, filled with reminiscing and remember this and that. Um, so I had presumed that this was important in these ways. But it seems that a lot of this probably rests on more primitive psychological systems that we share with a lot of other animals and not so much on episodic memory. So okay, does that mean it's a mistake to think that episodic memory plays a crucial role in our identities? I actually don't think so. Um, we have to take the example of Ms. McKinnon, although as I've said, it's provisional, seriously, right? It seems clear that a great deal of what we care about and associate with hum in human life and identity doesn't rely directly on episodic memory. But that, uh, and, and also I just want to be clear, I don't mean to in any way imply that Ms. McKinnon or others who don't have episodic memory are therefore less people, they're less persons, or that their lives are less meaningful or valuable uh, than the lives of those who do have episodic memory. But still, it's hard to deny that these memories do seem really important to those of us who have them. Um, and loss of them seems like a great loss. People fear losing these memories. They work very hard to retain them. So I think it's worth trying to understand what's behind this sense and what that might have to do with identity. And that's what I'm going to try to do in the rest of the paper, just sort of some speculation and thinking about it. Um, and the way to do it, I think, is by returning to the case of Ms. McKinnon, uh, who got us started with this, and asking what, if anything, could be missing from her admittedly full life, right? Is she missing something by not having these episodic memories? And again, there's only so much that we can tell from the case, but there were two moments in the description of the case that I found very striking and that I think hold some clues. So I'll say a little bit there and then just sort of riff on it. So the first concerns an incident that occurred when Ms. McKinnon and her husband lived in Arizona. 
and her husband was out fishing and he got jumped by a group of white guys and beaten up pretty badly. And he came home covered with bruises and welts and told her what happened and she got very, very upset and started crying and then he started crying and so on. But what they tell us in the article is that in the present, and here's a quote, McKinnon knows the salient facts of the story, but the details and the painful associations all reside with Green, her husband. For McKinnon, the memory doesn't trigger the trauma and the fear associated with it. I can imagine being upset and scared, but I don't remember that at all, she says. I can't put myself back there. I can only imagine what it would have been like. The author observes that Ms. McKinnon is lucky to be spared these painful memories, and in some sense, undoubtedly, she is, right? Painful memories are painful, so it's good to be spared them. But it also seems like something is lost. What is it? What are some of the things that might be lost? Well, to begin, it seems as there's a certain distinctive form of intimacy with her husband um, that she's going to lose by not being able to recollect this. I mean, think about what it would be like for him if we just shift attention from her to him, for his wife to have no recollection of this traumatic incident that they lived through together. I mean, as they recollect it, he's shaken again, and she's like, yeah, I guess it must have been bad. That probably was a bad thing. I mean, that would be sort of um, difficult. I mean, it's clearly extremely common for people who have lived through difficult experiences together to discuss and rehearse and go over those experiences. Um, think, for instance, of siblings who've had a trouble upbringing when they get together at holidays and, and say, do you remember what it was like then <laughs> during that period of our lives? That was crazy, right? Do you remember what, what we went through? Or comrades who have been through battle together, or first responders who have been through a really difficult call together, right? They get together and they talk about it. Reliving an intense experience with others who is there is, is common and clearly a meaningful phenomenon. And there are lots of reasons for this, right? Um, the idea that going through difficult times together is a way of bonding in a particularly intense way is, I think, a pretty well-established one. So let's think about some of the things that it does. Well, to some extent, it may just be an irreducible fact that being together during these kinds of significant and intense moments forges a close connection. And it's also the case that we just value having someone who can stand as witness to what we've been through and to know what we've seen and endured. And I think, just as an aside, that this is connected in an interesting way to another question that I've been trying to think about, which is, why does it seem so significant when the last surviving witness of a particular historical event, right, uh, a war or, right, civil rights march or whatever, when the last one dies, why do we think that's so important if we actually have the information? Witnesses are very important and witnesses of what's happened to us in the past are very important. Furthermore, I think there's a sense that those who have been through these kinds of experiences with us understand us or know us in some deeper or at least different way than those who weren't there. And there are two senses in which this might be so, and I th it'll be clear later that it's sort of artificial to distinguish these two senses, but it, it's helpful for exposition to do it. So first, people who've been through these kinds of experiences with us have seen or encountered parts of us, since they've seen us in circumstances that others are not likely to see us in, have probably encountered parts of us that others are unlikely to have encountered. And so they know parts of us that other people don't know. Because in crisis situations, you'll often exhibit emotions and behaviors that don't emerge in everyday life. And second, there's a, these kinds of events have a lasting impact on people. And so the nature of the impact can be understood in a particularly clear way by those who have also been through the experience. Again, think of veterans of the front who find relief in getting together with comrades who understand their nightmares or feelings of alienation in a way that those who weren't there just can't. Now, I can't make the claim, um, I, I don't have evidence to make the claim that the kinds of bonds or close relationships I'm talking about here require actually remembering these events together rather than just having lived through them together. I think, you know, how much depends on what is an empirical question, and as it turns out, nobody has studied it that I can find, um, but I'm working on finding some stuff on that. 
But either way, it seems undeniable that people do find comfort and intimacy in actually getting together with people who have been through these aversive events with them and rehearsing them. And this feature of a relationship just isn't possible for Ms. McKinnon. And I'll just say as an aside, I think it can also be, I mean, there are bad ways of doing this that, that can be harmful. I don't deny that. I'm not saying that it's always good for people. But it certainly seems to be meaningful and important for people. It's a kind of intimacy that people look for. It's also important to note, moving from this you know, particular event in the case, that the observation that the author makes that Ms. McKinnon is lucky to be spared memory of painful events fails to note that she is equally cut off from the pleasure of recalling happy events, right? So reliving traumatic or painful times may play an important role in relationships, but we're likely to spend most of our reminiscing time thinking about happy times and the good old days when we were young or later when the kids were young or when the grandkids were young or whatever, right, back when we were the state champions. That's really what we spend most of our time reminiscing about. Um, and the ubiquity and importance of this kind of reminiscing, I think, is undeniable. So here the role of others, uh, having others to remember with, may be somewhat different than in the case of painful memories. But it's also clear that we really value, there's a lot of overlap as well, and we really value reliving those days with someone who is there. So um, why? Well, there are a lot of reasons, right? Um, the elements that I discussed in describing painful memories, many of them apply here in modified form. While it's comforting to have a witness to one's past trauma, or there's some importance to having a witness to past trauma, it's also uh, very nice to have a witness to one's past triumphs. We want people to see when we triumphed, and we want people to know us triumphant, and people who were there with us and saw it, and saw right when things were good for us, um, have a particular kind of knowledge for us. And those who have known us for a long time are also likely to know us better than those who haven't, right? Not maybe specifically because they saw us in a very intense situation, although they're more likely to have, but just because they've seen us in a wide range of circumstances, right? Someone who knew me when knows what I was like in some very different circumstances than the ones I'm in now, and they know my full repertoire in a way that others who know me less, uh, have known me less long, might not. So, for instance, my high school self may well be invisible to my students or even my colleagues, but my old high school friends know that part of me. And if you uh, talk to elderly couples, right, who have been together for a very, very long time, it's really important to them that they know each other as, say, the avid dancer or athlete or natty dresser or carefree adventurer that they were when they know that to the rest of the world they're just feeble old people who are, you know, sort of just shuffling along, right? There's a further point to be made here, however, and that's this. Frequently remembering old times and those who were there does more than simply bear witness to the way that one was in the past and say, I know you have been this way or that way. But it can reawaken part of the past self. I mean, because after all, that's the thing about episodic memory. What it does is it makes you re-experience the past. It comes with imagery and affect, right? And this can be so with either positive or negative recollections. Even putting aside extreme cases like PTSD or something which I think needs its own treatment because it's its, its own thing, Recalling time on the battlefield can bring back the frightened, terrified young soldier of that day, but recalling the day on which one's team won the state championship can bring, you know, the used car salesman back to the exuberant, undefeatable self who captained the team. And remembering a difficult patch in a relationship, I was actually just reading a passage of a novel of this where someone was remembering a really difficult patch in a relationship and just got angry all over again, right? It brings up the angry humiliated self who had given up, but recalling courtship or spending time where you had your first date or fell in love or looking at the you know, pictures from when you were young and in love can rekindle those feelings again. And even parts of the self that might be thought to be long gone can be reawakened in this way sometimes, parts that we didn't know could be. 
So getting together with friends from graduate school after many, many years might bring back the young professor who was so excited by her work every day, right? Returning to grade school reunion may turn the confident, successful businesswoman back into the frightened, immature, and uh, insecure person who had such a bad time of it during those years. And with some supernatural help from the ghost of Christmas past, even Ebenezer Scrooge, right, was able to recover his compassionate, loving self. And it all starts with a visit to his boyhood school and the place where he was an apprentice and recalling those days that he had long since forgotten the ghost. So strange to have forgotten it for so long. He gets all exuberant and starts dancing around when he goes back. Now, this isn't to say that it's always possible to reawaken parts of the past or that we never lose any features of ourselves forever. And I think there's probably a lot of personal variation in this regard to how much we retain and lose and how easy it is to reawaken things. But I do want to say that it's a common thing to have parts of one's past reawakened by remembering with others. I'm also not trying to say remembering the past with others is the only way in which this can happen. I think we all know this phenomenon occurs in a lot of ways, and it's well known that it's often in response to sensory stimulation. So when I hear that song on the radio, you know, play our song, or the song that I used to listen to, or I smell a smell from the past, that, you know, gym floor polish or whatever it is, uh, someone's perfume, or when you get off the plane and it's that humid ocean breeze air that's there every year on vacation, or in perhaps the most famous example from Remembrance of Things Past, when I taste the tea-soaked you know, cookie and it all comes back to me from the taste of the thing. Um, these are all ways in which we can reawaken and sometimes we can try to make it happen by spending time with photographs. Sometimes it's voluntary, sometimes it's involuntary. It can happen a lot, sometimes we don't know how. But as Joan Didion puts it, I think we're well advised to keep on nodding terms with the people we used to be, whether we find them attractive company or not. Otherwise, they turn up unannounced and surprise us, come hammering on the mine's door at 4 a.m. of a bad night and demand to know who deserted them, who betrayed them, and who's going to make amends, right? You never know when your old point of view, your old self is going to come back. So the general point I want to make is that we should take the mental time travel aspect of episodic memory seriously in this way. In episodic memory, I don't just get information about the past. Um, in some, it says in, in, in most episodic memories, I mean, it's characteristic of episodic memory, that in it I re-inhabit the first person point of view I used to hold. And again, I just want to reiterate because it's important, it's not like I literally plug in the videotape and have exactly the experience I had before. But what I do have is a feeling of what it's like to be that old self. Suddenly I remember not just, you know, that I used to do this or that when I was young, but I remember what it's like to have fun or to be looking for something to do at 11 o'clock at night instead of being ready to go to sleep or to be afraid of authority or angry all the time. I remember these things by experiencing them, by having them be part of how I feel right now, by having the world look to me again as it did at that period of my life. And this last point I think has really important, I mean, I, I hope all of it has important implications, but this has especially important implications for the connection I want to draw between memory and identity. And to tease out those connections, I'm going to turn now to the second element in the story of Ms. McKinnon that really struck me. Um, and I think it may uh, strike college students less than it struck me, but I will uh, tell you. So the author of the article says of Ms. McKinnon that she is oblivious to the diminishments of aging and continues, a 1972 yearbook photo shows that she was once a petite brunette with a delicate face framed by a pixie cut. On an intellectual level, McKinnon knows that this is her but put the picture away, and in her mind, she has always been the 60-year-old woman she is now, broad-shouldered and fair, her face pinkish and time-lined, her hair closely cropped white and gray. It's also mentioned that she has no recollection whatsoever of ever having been a child. She never remembers being shorter than she was now, or having more energy, or needing to go to sleep earlier, or anything like that. This seems to me a really remarkable form of experience and one with implications worth considering. So first of all, there's the implication that's highlighted in the article, 
which is that she can't experience herself as having changed. She just is what she is. But surely the experience of change and the corresponding experience of ourselves as changeable beings is a crucial part of human life and one closely connected to the construction of identity. It's not only physical differences that are invisible to Ms. McKinnon, um, but differences in her attitudes and psychological patterns. So she can't, as it were, internally contrast the nervousness she used to feel about speaking up when she was young with the ease and confidence with which she does so now, or the readiness and joy with which she now gives a compliment as opposed to the envy and resentment that used to make compliments difficult for her, or vice versa. Maybe now it's hard for her to give compliments. I mean, none of these are really about her, but there are ways in which you can experience yourself as having changed. And it certainly seems that the ability to experience this kind of contrast, and so to experience personal growth or devolution, depending which way you're going, probably some of each, plays a large role in human lives and is part of the broad ethical and emotional repertoire we're trying to capture in thinking about human identity. So I hope that point is relatively uncontroversial, but it raises an interesting question in light of our previous discussion, because just a couple of minutes ago, I was trying to make the case that episodic memory contributes to characteristic features of human life by allowing us to experience past perspectives and points of view as part of our current selves, right? They're still there. I can reawaken that past self. It's still there. It's not gone. Um, showing that we haven't changed as thoroughly as we or others might have thought. And here I'm emphasizing the fact that episodic memory allows us to experience these past perspectives as no longer belonging to us. I've changed. I'm no longer like that. So how am I going to reconcile these two claims? As it happens, I have a way. <laughs> um, a straightforward answer, right, would be simply to say that in some respects we change and in some respects we remain the same, and both of these are part of our identity. And surely that's true, and surely there's something right in it, but I think as it stands, it misses the real lesson that we can draw from these features of human experience, or one important lesson we can draw. In many cases, um, I would venture most, the experience of change, whether good or bad, is not simply an experience of a past, of myself having changed, not just change in the world, but of ch myself having changed, is not just an experience of a past self that's no longer me, but rather of the development or encouragement or expression of a different aspect of myself than the one that used to be expressed. So what does that mean? It means that past part can still be there even if I've changed. So the redeemed sinner, right, may claim to be reborn, but usually doesn't claim to just no longer be a sinner, right? It's like, oh yeah, I, I was a sinner, the sinner's gone, I'm now this new person, right? The idea is that the sinner is still there and vigilance is needed, right, to keep sin from returning. Or the, uh, you know, simple girl who's become a country megastar may believe and hope that the simple country girl she was is still there with all those values, is still there deep down, right? It's not that she's no longer there, it's just that now this other persona is being expressed. And by the same token, um, those who do experience past, so, so if, even if we experience ourselves as changed, it doesn't mean that the old part isn't there anymore. It means that we've mastered it in, in many cases. Um, or we've lost our ability, depending on whether we think the change is good or bad, we've lost our ability to express it, but we think it's still there somewhere deep down. And by the same token, those who do experience past perspectives as living parts of themselves don't fail to notice that things are also different now, right? And this is why I kept insisting it's not like you're just replaying the video, you have that first personal experience again, but it's not quite the same, right? You can't inhabit your past point of view as if the intervening years had never happened. So the careworn, serious attorney who lets loose at her college reunion and feels all young and fun-loving again doesn't just experience the fun-loving, carefree self as still part of who she is. She also experiences her distance from that self and how bogged down she's become in the grind of adult life, right? Um, the fun-loving, uh, the sweetness of the relaxed attitude you feel when you're on vacation, right? This is my vacation self. 
you don't think that your work self is gone. You know that it's going to come back after you get back from vacation. It's still there waiting um, to assert itself again. So experience of the continued existence of past points of view is at the same time an experience of their dis difference from present points of view. And this means, among other things, that when we engage in mental time travel of the sort I've been talking about, we necessarily experience ourselves as multifaceted beings. And this is the main idea that I'm, I'm going to try to develop uh, in the time I have remaining. We experience our current perspective as just one of many that we'll experience and have experienced. And this allows us to experience ourselves as more than what's manifest at the moment, even to ourselves. Right? It's because we know these first person experiences perspectives can come and go, that the one I have now isn't the one that I always had. It's probably not the one I'm going to have. That, for instance, I can perhaps have hidden depths, right? Um, I can be full of surprises. I can be more than people um, think I am. I can be capable uh, of more than people think I'm capable of, more than even I think I'm capable of. And I, the person I am, can be capable of things that I'm not capable of right now, right? In the right circumstances, this is who I could be. It would still be me, um, but just not me as I am right at the moment. This is a kind of self-experience uh, that is not available, it seems, to creatures that can't engage in mental time travel. And it does seem to be unavailable to Ms. McKinnon. She just is what she is, as I said, in the moment. Um, she's not more than that. So when we experience ourselves as multifaceted beings in these, this way, we're taking all of these facets to be part of us. We're understanding ourselves as containing multitudes, and that is a particular form of experience of identity that I think is very characteristically human. And the ability to experience ourselves as changing this way also allows us to experience ourselves as beings that continue over time, something that's always been, uh, that's, that's also been connected with the sort of depth and meaning of human life, something that allows us to engage in the kinds of relationships and projects that we do. Um, so when we experience ourselves as multifaceted in the way I just described, we necessarily experience our present point of view as just one among many. We have one viewpoint at the moment, one outlook on the world, one set of cares, concerns, and motivations. But we know from direct experience in episodic memory that we've had others in the past. And this gives rise to, I say, an experience of an ongoing I, a someone who has all of these experiences, who takes on all of these different perspectives at different times. There's an ongoing I. There's me, there's me as I am now, but that's just not the whole story. So to understand this point in a little bit more depth, um, it will be important to, to talk about, I mean, I keep reiterating the fact that in episodic memory, we don't simply re-experience things as they were at first. And so now it will be helpful to say a little bit more about what that means phenomenologically, how, that, how we experience that. So what I want to say is that when we have episodic memory, it comes to us as something that was in our past. So it comes to us as a perspective we used to have that we are now re-experiencing in the context of present experience. So in having such a memory, we're in an important sense holding on to two first-person perspectives at the same time, which is, um, I think, important to our having the kinds of identities we have. So to understand what it means to hold on to two perspectives at the same time, I will invoke a useful analogy with uh, reading literary narratives. And I am deeply grateful to Peter Goldie, who develops this perspective or this analogy for slightly different purposes, but does a beautiful job of it. So I'm mostly just borrowing from him right here. So when I read a novel, for instance, I have to hold on to more than one perspective at a time to really engage the novel as a narrative. I need, for instance, to take the perspective of the characters in the novel, see things through their eyes, but also the perspective of the narrator who knows things that the characters don't, right? So the, the narrator can have knowledge the characters don't. So I have to both see how things look to the character who 
you know, doesn't know that this is the, the evil murderer. And the view of the narrator, um, who does know it or does know what this, this person is cheating or whatever. And my own uh, perspective, maybe wondering whether this narrator is reliable and whether I should trust what, you know, this, where the narrator is leading me, what the narrator is leading me to conclude. But these different perspectives, when I read a novel, it's not like they're held in different compartments of my brain and they're distinct from one another, like there's a little part that's the character and a little part that's the narrator. They're all there at the same time. They're all interacting with one another. I'm sort of shifting between them. And somehow, the experience of the narrative of the whole, the whole story, comes out of the interaction of these different perspectives. So what I'm trying to say here is that something similar happens in episodic memory. We have access to the first person perspective from the past, but also to our present perspective from which we might interpret those past events differently than we did before, right? So here's a concrete example of why it's not just replaying things in your brain or how it might not be. So I might, for instance, this is not a real example, remember with some shame that when I was 16, I naively thought it was the height of glamour to put on nine inch heels and lots of blue eyeshadow and go to dinner at the local restaurant and homecoming. And when I have a memory like that, were I to have such a memory, um, included in it, if it were an episodic memory, would be a forceful experience both of what it was like to be that 16 year old and how good I felt in those heels and how pretty and excited and glamorous I felt. And I certainly didn't feel naive at the time. Um, and the experience of how it looks to me now, how I interpret having been that person now. And both of them are somehow me. Um, and when I have these two perspectives, I experience myself as continuing. I experience myself as having been that 16-year-old girl who became this person here. And it's somehow all connected there and gives me a sense of a whole life. Um, and I think that this sense of a whole life is a really important component of building an identity. So um, from the ridiculous to the sublime, a lovely literary example of the kind of experience uh, that I have in mind here is found in the novel Middlemarch in a passage describing Dr. Lydgate's youthful infatuation with an actress. And so what Eliot says in this passage is, he knew that this was like the sudden impulse of a madman, incongruous with his habitual foibles. No matter, it was the one thing which he was resolved to do. He had two selves within him apparently, and they must learn to accommodate each other and bear reciprocal impediments. Strange that some of us with quick alternate vision see beyond our infatuations and even while we rave on the heights, behold the wide plain where our persistent self pauses and awaits us. All right, so he's there, he's in that infatuation, he's going to pursue it, it's their full force, and yet at the same time, he's aware that he's gonna be on the other side of it at some point. At some point, he's gonna go back to his doctoring and look back at it. And, and I think this is a really common kind of um, experience. It's, you know, someday we'll look back at this and it will be funny. These are the days we'll remember, right? I can come up with a million lines from songs that, that name this phenomenon. Right? But think about how complicated this experience really is. Lydgate recalls how things appeared to him before. He experiences how different that is from how things appear now. And at the same time, he knows that things are going to be different in the future. And all of this is there at once. All of it uh, is including the experience of that persistent self who just patiently goes through all these changes. So that's pretty much what I wanted to say about these two features of the story of Ms. McKinnon. Uh, and having laid out some of the ways in which her experience might be altered or impoverished by her lack of episodic memory, I just want to come back and quickly uh, consider some of the ways in which these differences might be relevant or not to the question of identity. I mean, I've pointed at it throughout, but let me try to sort of pull things together a bit um, and give some shape to them. Well, maybe some shape to the thing uh, before I will then uh, take questions, so this will be very quick. So to the extent that we can take the description of Ms. McKinnon's uh, case at face value, I think it's clear 
that it's possible to have much of what constitutes a human life without episodic memory. She has meaningful relationships, projects, moral attitudes, and so on. So I do think that any, I mean, I, I'm cautioned against any kind of strong conclusion of the form you must have episodic memories to have a full human life or, or anything like that. But I also think, nevertheless, that it's, we've been able to uncover some elements of human experience that she doesn't have that can reasonably be said to have an important role in making us who do have episodic memory who and what we are, those of us who do. We don't know how widespread this lack of episodic memory is. I mean, it might be quite widespread, actually. So let me try to say a few words to explain what I mean by this. First, I've suggested that there are certain forms of human intimacy which appear, uh, appear to be crucially connected to remembering shared life experiences. The act of reminiscing or talking about past experiences, good or bad, seems to provide a kind of bonding and relationship that's possible only when the details and emotions of the time are, to at least some extent, reawakened in both participants. So that's one crucial thing. But I've also argued that episodic memory gives an especially complex form of experience of self. I may know that I have had particular past experiences via semantic memory, but it's in having access to the first person point of view of what it was like then that I come to experience those various perspectives as mine in a really robust and fundamental way. And insofar as they're re-experienced in episodic memory, they're not just part of my past, but a living part of who and what I am now. Even perspectives that I don't have access to at the moment might come back, right? And, and therefore, I understand myself as a being that has all these facets and can be all these different ways. Finally, there's a way in which episodic memory gives rise to a sense of ourselves as continuing over time. And this is a feature of human experience that's been linked to particular ethical and emotional depth and significance because it's when we're aware of our own continuation, that we can do a lot of the, um, we can be engaged in a lot of the plans, projects, relationships, that we can think about our own mortality in a, a particular way of our aging and of all of these things that seem to be a crucial part of human self-understanding and human identity. Um, and the kind of first person access to past experiences found in episodic memory also seems to play, uh, for this reason, an essential role in characteristically human emotions like nostalgia or regret for lost dreams or enthusiasm for what I'm going to accomplish in the future and so on. This kind of multi-perspectival experience seems necessary, for instance, for the kinds of experience we find on occasions that Laura Karstensen of the Stanford Center on Longevity describes as the occasions where you smile with a tear in your eye. So graduations, weddings, fest shrifts, when you leave your quirky little apartment, when you move out of your dorm room and you say, you know, you have this real sense, this is over, right? I had this period of my life, it's over, I was like that, I'm going to be different, right? I'm going to remember that. All of these things seem to require the kind of multifaceted sense of self and sense of self in time um, that come with uh, episodic memory or, or to which episodic memory seems to, important to, to contribute importantly. And that last bit, um, I think, might lead some people to wonder, well then, why do we want that kind of sense of identity, right? I mean, if what it gives us is the ability to cry when happy things like weddings are happening or graduations or to feel nostalgic or to regret our crushed dreams, wouldn't we be better off um, to be like uh, Ms. McKinnon and just to be what we are in the moment? And certainly there are many traditions that say that. And I have some things to say about that if people are interested, but I think I have spoken long enough. So I'll leave you with that thought and take your questions. Thank you so much.
memories that might not be entirely accurate in how they mm-hmm. might fit into yeah. um, identity. Mm-hmm. If you can imagine a case where an individual remembers a past experience like maybe they were the lead in a play. Mm-hmm. They remember their perspective as being all about the limelight and being mm-hmm. interested in that. They have their perspective now where they view what was really important for mm-hmm. the relationships they formed. But in reality, in that past event, they were really just very nervous. Right. So um, does that kind of memory play the same role? Yeah. In Excellent question. Um, and a big question. So I'll tell you what I believe, you know, what I think about this, what my position is, but it's something that I'm really working on now and trying to develop. Um, And I actually had something in the paper about it, but I thought, oh, it's too complicated. I think the accuracy doesn't matter. I think probably our memories are almost never accurate. Um, there's really good evidence. I mean, and we don't even know what accurate means in some sense. You know, you get some of it right, you get some of it wrong. The details are right. Some of how you felt was was right. Some of how you felt was wrong. So, so I think, I mean, the case that I would really want to make. And so, one of the things that I, that I also really think is, um, it's not so much episodic memory per se that's doing the work that I'm interested in. It's the ability to experience yourself as having had other first-person points of view, whether you actually had that particular one or not, that at least structurally gives you this sort of sense of yourself as complicated and multifaceted and changing and replete with possibilities and sort of gives you a sense that things are contingent and they might be different in a way that you wouldn't get if you just, you know, this is just how things are, how I experience them now. I, you know, I don't have access to the other things. That's the case that I want to make. And, and I actually think, I mean, this is a thing that I've been trying to uh, work actually with a psychologist at UIC with to get some data. Um, it turned out a lot of what I was thinking of as episodic memory isn't really episodic memory because it's too general. It's not for a specific occasion. So you might say, you know, I remember Thanksgivings at grandma's when I was growing up. And it doesn't have to be a particular Thanksgiving at grandma's. Like you sort of, it has images and it has emotions. You can smell the smells and you sort of know what the food was and who was there. But like there were a bunch of them and you just take bits and pieces and you sort of have the feel of it. So I mean I, I think it's more the ability to do that kind of thing, more mental time travel. And also I think it's very connected. It's telling that this, you know, the people who have severely deficient autobiographical memory syndrome also have a lot of trouble projecting themselves imaginatively into the future, which, as it turns out, doesn't mean that they have trouble like saving for, you know, like knowing that they're going to need money when they retire and they should, I mean, it it doesn't have that effect. But if you say, you know, how do you think you're going to feel about things when you just, you know, Um, so what do you think you're going to be doing in 10 years? You know, I mean, so... So I think it's more the mental time travel, which we do both backward and forward in some ways. And when, when you're going forward, you know it isn't true because you know you're imagining what it could be like. You're thinking, what's it going to be like you know, when I'm retired and I don't have money? I better, right? So, so I think accuracy doesn't play that huge a role. But I think there have to be constraints, right? At some point, if you're just, you know, if I remember having been the Queen of England and how worried I was about my subjects, um, that's going to be a problem in, in some other way. But yeah, so I mean, there's a lot that needs to be worked out there. I don't have a worked out position, but that's where I'm hoping to go with it. Mm-hmm. Or McKinnon? McKinnon. McKinnon. Uh, I suppose what I'm really going to be asking about is I, I don't think I know what, an ep- what episodic memory is. Yeah. To try to get clear on that. So she, can she have current uh, 
thoughts that would be, you know, that are not semantic thoughts, but are, you know, I'm currently feeling shitty or I'm currently feeling in danger or whatever. She can have those. But it I seems so, yeah. But two seconds later, she can't. I, mean, she, I think it's not two seconds, probably. I mean, this is. Yeah, right. Point, does it cease to be a thought and becomes a memory? And what what is it that she's lacking? And she was at one point when I when you described her case, I thought, well, this is a person just just lacks the ability. To, they, she lacks they say attitudes basically. She's unable to to think of what it is to be effing, <clears> right? Um, but it sounds like that's wrong. She she knows what it's like to be effing. She just don't know what it was like to be effing mm -hmm. or will like it to be effing. Is, is right. Like so I think it, it isn't two seconds as long as she's feeling it. She's feeling it, okay. right? So. Um, because someone has said that too, you know, I mean, is she, somebody asked me this question, so she's like really angry at her husband and then a second later she can't remember it? No, because anger lasts longer than that, right? So while they're having the fight, she knows she's angry. Um, and six months or six years later she can tell you, yeah, we had a big fight and I was really angry. So what she's lacking, and, and what I think is maybe a lot of people lack this, and there's a lot of variation. I mean, one of the things, I, I, I actually just sat down with two memory psychologists and said, I have completely lost my grip on what episodic memory is. And they said, yeah, but it's, it's a widely recognized category. I mean, this is still the canon. I mean, that doesn't mean it's true, but I just, um, or right. I mean, that's why they need philosophers to come in and clean all this up. But, but the idea is, I mean, to the extent that you can have the, um, you know, you can remember the fight and you're like, you get upset again. Um, you don't have to get upset just like you did. You might be ashamed. You're like, oh, I was yelling and I was so mad, and I, right? But there's, there, and you have images. So, I mean, another thing that, you know, her husband is reminiscing about how he grew up on the south side of Chicago, as it turns out, and he's like, yeah, there used to be these dances people would hold in their basements and you'd go down there and there was Motown playing and the lights were all dim. I mean, he has all that picture in his head. She doesn't have any of that picture in her head. She remembers that, you know, but yeah. yeah. One, one quick yeah. follow-up related. I think yeah. Maybe she has a complete substitute for that in terms of propositional contents, right? I mean, maybe some kind of judgments regarding fittingness of emotions, does she have that? Like, now it would be fitting to feel anger, right? If I were in that situation. Right, yes. And she think she does. Those counterfactuals and she does, be, I, I mean, I think, because I, um, there are these two instances in the thing where the one where they're talking about the time her husband got beaten up. And I mean, and I think that in some ways shows the whole thing, right? He's saying these guys jump me while I, and you know, and that the indignation and the fear, I mean, it all sort of comes back to him. And what she can say is, I mean, and at the time, I mean, the interesting thing is that at the time, she was completely empathetic. It's not that she lacks empathy or moral That's response. That's where I'm going with this is, yeah. is, is Herself, from, from your account, it sounds like what she lacks is the ability to understand a temporally extended self in the first person <clears throat> sense. Yeah. And what that seems to strike me is that she would have um, a deficiency with empathizing across time. So yes. um, she could sympathize or in yeah, whatever right. way you want to spell that out. So her, her, the temporal extension of herself is, is supported entirely by her semantic memory. Right. Um, so. But like I said, there's a lot of questions I want to ask about like how this could make her, from like say a sentimentalist moral point of view, morally deficient, but also... I don't say that she's morally deficient. I don't want to say that she's morally deficient, though. Well, if, if it turns out yeah. that she is, yeah. <laughs> we have to be able to... We have to be able to say, you're right, you're right. But yeah. there's yeah. also, besides going back and forth in time, I wanted to yeah. know about dreams. But immediately I thought yeah. there should be a song here, Susie's Dreams, about yeah. the person. How does she dream? Yeah, that I don't know. I I am, have wondered about that too, and I'm trying to get more information about her. Okay. Well, I, I'm doing, you can see why I'm asking. Right. Because this would be does her um, inability to paint the person personally across time also um, affect her when she doesn't know that it, 
It's her, it's, isn't it? It's her. Yes. Exactly. Right. Fascinating, but I just wanted to see what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, so I think that um, what she can't have, I mean, in a way, the metaphor I keep coming back to, because it's sort of in the Lydgate quote, and I really like it, is that of perspective, right? We're in our daily lives, and then there's this idea that you can get perspective by sort of pulling back, and you know, okay, this matters a lot now, but it's not, right? Um, but she doesn't, I mean, that seems to be what she lacks. The, I mean, she just is where she is, and she feels how she feels, and she knows that people, you know, that she, I mean, she knows that she has felt differently at other times, but she has no access really to what that's like. And I suspect she can't imagine it. Like, I suspect, I mean, maybe related to the dreams, is if you said to her, well, pretend you're really mad at your husband right now. She'd be like, well, you know. So, I mean, so it's a couple of things I can tell you that may be helpful here um, that I do know about the case. I mean, one is, as I said, she can't project herself into the future. And the way she describes it is that they say to her, like, pretend you're on a beach. And she's like, okay. And, like, there's a palm tree. And she's like, okay. And another palm tree in a hammock. And she's like, wait a minute, you know. I can see the beach, but then when I look at the palm tree, I lose the beach. And then when I look at the other palm tree, and then the neurological work that has been done does suggest that, that it's some kind of visual. I mean, that, that there's, whatever the impairment is physiologically, it, it somehow um, is connected to, to image processing. So it is, it's an imaginative, I think it's a more global imaginative thing, which goes back to the question of how much of our episodic memory is imagination right. anyway, yeah, right? Yeah. So, I mean, I think it's, it's sort of a more, I mean, it's more about not being able to imagine herself um, first personally as anything other than she is, maybe. Well, like I said, I've got a lot of other questions, okay. especially with the moral issues, but... Uh, yeah, the moral issues I'd like to, t yeah, that would be what's happening. That, yeah, so, uh, good. I, I had a question, but I think it's off topic enough. I'll just wait and ask later. Plus, it's a moral question, so. <laughs> as long as it's moral, I don't like those immoral <laughs> questions. <laughs> fair, fair. Okay. Um, when I compare my memories with my wife's mm -hmm. memories, it's it's really quite amazing. <laughs> There's a song about that too. <laughs> yeah. You know, I'll say. Yeah. You know, yeah, we went someplace in 1978, and that's about all I can come mm -hmm. up with. And then, whammo, she she has like this this complete, beautiful, colorful memory mm -hmm. of every detail <laughs> that we. And, I, and I'm going, how can you possibly remember all that? So. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so I, I think it's an indication that this difference, you know, is a gradual kind of thing. It's probably right you know, all over the place. And I I agree that there's just probably a big spectrum, and yeah, she's at one end of it. And, and uh, so, if there's a big spectrum, and I'm on the end of the spectrum, what? Sorry. <laughs> what does that imply for you? Yeah, well, I mean... identity in danger? Well, so, the, I mean, that is a good question. I mean, because when I started this thing, I mean, you know, the, the sort of genesis of it is that Galen Strawson was saying, I don't have any sense of myself having existed in the past or the future. Um, Kathleen Wilkes says to him, well, then you can't be a moral agent because to you know, make a promise, you have to think you're going to be there in the future to carry out the promise and to, you know, to remember that you made the promise and so on. And he said, I don't have to think any of that. I just have to know there's, that promise was made in this human history and by some other self that used to inhabit it. And I thought, wow, that's weird. No, you have to do more than just know that some, someone in your human history promised it. You have to think you promised it. And then 
I thought when I first got the case of Susie McKinnon that she looked like someone who merely knew that someone in her human history had promised it and was perfectly able to keep the promise. And I thought, well, geez, how many times does, does it happen that someone says, you promised? And I'm like, no, I didn't. And then I look at my email and it's like, oh, I guess I did, right? I mean, so then the whole thing got complicated for me. Um, and so what I'm really struggling to try to understand is, well, what is it to, to take it to be you who made that promise and therefore you who's obligated to keep it? Um, well, and, that's that's yeah. forward looking and I don't have any trouble there. <laughs> well, it could be backward looking that you have to know that you made the promise if you're gonna keep it now, right? You have to remember. Yes, but I can do that propositionally. Well, right, so that's the, the question is that is, is is it just, so what I'm thinking is that it, it can't be just propositional with no identification with that past person at all. So what does that identification matter? I think, and I think that there are, I think that there are a lot of things that need to be separated here. So maybe uh, it will help to separate some of them. Because some of it has to do, um, with these very specific moral agency questions. And I think, you know, it's pretty clear this woman is a perfectly good moral agent. She keeps her promises, she has her friends, she has her projects, right? She's a devoted spouse. So, so I think whatever, so that stuff obviously it's possible to do um, without episodic memory. And so part of the question I was trying to get is, well then, um, what do you lose if you lose episodic memory? And maybe the real answer to your question is to say, um, well maybe some of this stuff that I pointed to is lost, but maybe that's just some of the stuff, right? I mean, and other stuff is gained. I mean, I, I think you know, the other side of the coin is there are trade-offs. I mean, the people in the article kept saying, it's actually, she's very fortunate not to have this or that, and you know, her sense of self is maybe less muddy, right, than the sense of self of people. So, so I think it's, it's not possible, and I just, you know, stuck in a sentence to say this because I realized it wasn't possible, but then I had to worry about what my paper was about, <laughs> you know. It's not possible to say this is what you need to have an identity or to you know live a human life, and if you don't have this, because clearly that can't be right. There's a lot of personal variation, and so maybe what I can say is just well, um, what I'm exploring is just the fact that there is this connection that people draw between memory and identity. Um, there are a lot of people who really, really value their memories in a, I mean, in general, people right, have their cherished memories and reminiscing is a thing and scrapbooking is like a multi-billion dollar industry and all of that. So part of it maybe is just trying to say, well, what's going on there and, and what is the connection? And, and I think, honestly, the closest connection I can draw, I mean, what it really gives you is that stuff I was saying at the end about, you know, whether you cry when you see sunrise, sunset, and Fiddler on the Roof, and, you know, or singing about the little children growing up. I mean, whether you're susceptible to, to these kinds of, to emotions like nostalgia, to experiencing simultaneously, um, you know, sameness and difference and, and a path. So, and that seems to me to be something that, that isn't captured fully propositionally. And it does seem that, that Susie McKinnon is different. Um, so, I mean, I guess this is all a roundabout way of saying in the long run, maybe the claim really isn't gonna be easily made as a claim about what you need to have an identity and more has to be a claim about insofar as people connect memory and identity, um, here's one of the things that may be going on. Um, but it's okay with me if it's not universal. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, 
early on in your talk, oh, no, oh, early, early on in your talk, you, mm -hmm. you said that unlike some people, you think that uh, there are animals other than human mm -hmm. beings who mm -hmm. think do have this kind of episodic memory, but <clears throat> you were willing to acknowledge that there are others that might not. Mm -hmm. right? Now, I guess my intuition is that those that don't do have some kind of identity, right? And so what I'm trying to understand is, is it the episodic memory that is what you add to the identity for persons? Is, is that what it's all about? It's, it's, is it the fact that, it's, that we're persons? And, and so there's identity, and then there's identity of what? In this case, it's personhood. Is, is, mm -hmm. that, is that what that's all about? I'm not, I'm not well, so, sure. Well, so, yeah. Because certainly you do want to say, I mean, if the notion of identity over time makes any sense, Let's yeah. assume it does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it seems to me that, I don't know, turtles, I don't know if they have any right. side memory, they have identities over time, right? So it, is, is the story that you're telling what over and above the identity for these creatures it is that, mm -hmm. that persons have that, that makes their, is that what that? No. <laughs> yeah, so, but, but very legitimate question. Um, so... The word identity means all things to all people. It's a, it's a tough word, right? Um, and certainly, if you're talking about, you know, diachronic numerical identity, turtles have it if we have it. If anybody has it, right, turtles get to have it. If any, you know, organisms do. Um, but I also think that when people say memory is central to our identity or memory makes us who we are, that's not the kind of identity they're talking about. They're talking about, so in that sense, you know, uh, it's more of this sort of moral, um, broadly ethical sense of identity that philosophers tend to take, or many philosophers take to be unique to humans. I don't think even that kind of identity is unique to humans, but I do think turtles probably don't have it. Um, and, and that, you know, if you take an animal like, say, a dog, I'd be happy to say, look, dogs have personalities. It's not clear to me that they have identities in this sense. So if episodic memory, I mean, there, there was a time when a bunch of people thought that John Locke said that episodic memory is what gives you numerical identity. Um, but I don't think that's a, I don't think that's viable. I mean, I think that's, so, so it can't be that kind of identity. And I should have made that clear. Dylan, you were first. Uh, yeah, um, this is more of a psychological question though. I Kind of related to moral agency. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering uh, how Miss McKinnon, uh, how sophisticated her emotional intelligence and, and yeah. emotional literacy is. And I, I say that, I ask that simply because there are some <coughs> traditions that argue that it's not just acting right, but having the right corresponding right. emotion. And I was wondering if you could clarify that. Yeah, so um, that's another thing. I mean, there are all these, I have lists of things and I'm going to send up wish lists to send off to these people who are actually studying this and to ask them. The only real information I have about that, because the, the, there's one scientific paper on it, but that doesn't talk about any of the juicy, fun philosophy stuff. It's really like, you know, some neural stuff and, and tests on rotating shapes, right, and, you know, visual processing. Um, but the Wired article, the two things, um, you know, the two moments that show sort of what her emotional uh, repertoire is are the ones, I mean, in that story with her husband where at the time, she was clearly very upset because he came home and said, I'm okay, and then she, you know, just totally lost it, and then he lost it. So, um, so it seems like she can in the moment, and then there was, but, I mean, 
both when she was recalling that and also when they showed her a videotape of a performance that she had done where she had a big solo at the choir, um, they said, so, you know, how did you feel? She said, I have no idea. You know, she said, probably nervous. I would guess that, I, I mean, she knew, right, that nervous would be uh, a way someone would feel. And I think she probably knew that nervous was a way she would feel. I mean, she, th that's another thing I'd like to know, like how much insight she has into how she characteristically responds to things, how much she can, could tell you what kind of person she is in that way, uh, which is another test that wasn't done. But I, I mean, I think the fact, you know, of course, there are all kinds of things like sociopathy or nobody notices, but the fact that she has all these good friends from way back when who never noticed anything was up with her. And one of the things that she says about it, you know, suggests that she's able to interact with people pretty well. One of the things she says is, when people gave all that detail about what happened in the past, I just always assumed they were making it up, and so I made stuff up too. <laughs> she was like, I just thought that's what you did, you know, and they said, do you remember that dress? You were just like, yeah, sure, <laughs> it was red. <laughs> so, but, but I don't know, like, in any more depth than that. I don't have any more. But, uh, yeah. so, um, can I ask a quick follow-up then? Sure. Um, then, would that suggest maybe that episodic memory is not at all necessary for Moral agency? So, you know, I. Or to what extent, I should say. Yeah. See, that's where, I mean, I think, I mean, I don't have an answer to that question. The more I, I, because I don't have, a, I, I don't do ethics, so I don't have a developed sense of moral agency, right? Um, I mean, if you think that moral agency means something really strong, right? If you think, um, right, if you're Chris, Cor well, if you're Chris Korsgaard, I think she could do it propositionally. But, you know, maybe if you're, I don't know, right? Um, she could just say, all right, I commit myself to this. But, but certainly there are some theories according to which, um, you would need to have more access to sort of your motivational profile to be a full-blown moral agent. Um, on the other hand, I mean, not having a developed theory of moral agency, I hesitate to say that this woman who for all the world <laughs> looks like, you know, um, she's engaging in these practices in ways that matter to her and to those around her. Um, so, I mean, you know, I do think it would depend a lot on what your theory of moral agency is. And so maybe I'm sort of trying to do an end run around that because I think the problem of what constitutes moral agency is so hard by saying, um, you know, I mean, in something like the way that people sometimes say to Kantians, but how would you feel if that person was just doing it because they felt that it was their moral, you know, because they understood it to be their moral duty? Um, you could say, but, but what would it be like if you, you know, if the person said, I'm sure that it was very bad for you when those people beat you up, <laughs> but couldn't sort of be there with you? To what extent is that necessary? I mean, that's why I just say broadly ethical and leave it vague. I mean, because there's certainly some stuff you can do. She can keep promises. She can follow laws, right? She can be generous to people and that sort of thing. So, so yeah, really what I'm thinking is, well, let's think about what she can't do and what it might matter for, if anything. So, so the more I think about it, I'm sorry. No, uh, Jeremy, is this a direct follow-up? Yeah, it was a direct follow-up to Dylan. This, this, had, this was the type of moral question I had in mind. Yeah. Uh, not these deontological ways in which she's a good person, but her sort of uh, emotional mm -hmm. capacities. And to make it more precise, where you don't have to have a full-blown theory of moral agency, um, let me try to make a hypothetical case that won't sound too autobiographical. Um, good luck with that. I've seen, uh, <laughs> Delight at their misery, 
<laughs> Later, I regretted and felt ashamed at my emotions. Mm -hmm. She doesn't seem, doesn't seem like she would be capable of that kind of regret and shame, precisely because she can't remember what it was like to be devilishly delighting in another's pain. Mm -hmm. um, now, all of that could be true, and yet she keeps all her promises, right. doesn't cheat on her husband, does all the things we're supposed to do, and yet inside, I, I don't, I'm not trying to condemn this person. Now. Don't, don't no, I, I understand, yeah. No, no, I mean... Uh, all I was trying to get at was there seems to be some aspect of her emotional life that, if missing, would make her not morally deficient in any robust sense, but it, unable to participate in the kind of Again, I guess my background is the kind of shame and regret and guilt that I feel is necessary to a well-lived life. <laughs> you see, mm -hmm. yeah, no, well, right. So but she said she was Catholic, so yeah. Well, no, but she left the church. <laughs> she left the church, and she did not look back. Okay. Um, but I mean, I guess right. But but I mean, she also left the church because she felt it was oppressive, and because she was, you know. As far as I understand, I mean, you know, it's it's a five-page article. And I've made up a lot of this, but yeah, but I mean, you get you get the sense. But so here's my difficulty. I mean, what you're saying is is just where I came from, and because like I find whenever I start speaking in terms of moral agency or ethics, I get in trouble quickly. I mean, the way that I was trying to think about it, and again, going back to the sort of Strauss and Wilkes thing, one way that 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 kind of debate gets uh, put sometimes is in terms of depth and superficiality, right? I mean, so it's not like we're saying you're not a moral agent, but there seems to be some kind of superficiality to a life where you can't sit around and beat yourself for having delighted devilishly. But the problem that I have with that is um, the problem you brought up that when you start really looking into these things, people are so different. And they have these different strengths and weaknesses. And some people, you know, are really empathetic, but in some other ways completely thick. And some people are, you know, so are you going to go around saying of, you know, someone who is emotionally cold, but very, you know, generous? I mean, you, how do you start making those? Well, right. I agree. That's a problem for sentimentalist moral philosophy. Yeah. That's a very problem. But, Got know, some sentimentalists I, here, I, I, yeah, I see. I, I can imagine this. Suppose, you know, yeah. before she left the church, or she runs into somebody, and they're like all mopey and down, and she says, you know, what's wrong with you? And it's like, oh, I really regret feeling great when the Patriots mm -hmm. lost, or whatever. Oh, no, then you should never regret that. <laughs> 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 what are you teaching them here? She's capable of understanding that person's emotions fully because she's not able to have that particular type of emotion herself. Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't think I disagree with anything you said. I, and right. fact, I, think, I think I should be quiet because we're both at a point where we say, yes, this is a problem for sentimentalist moral philosophers to be able to reconcile cold but otherwise you know, generous people and, and, and so on. Well, right. So that's why I, instead of trying to give a moral theory, just say, look, you know, first let's try to understand what it is you would be missing with this. And it is, I mean, you know, an interesting question because I think that there do seem to be a lot, and there is a song about, you know, it was at six, it was at eight, I remember it well, or where they're going back and forth about remembering details. But, you know, and I think, you know, I said it would, should really, you know, bother her husband that she doesn't remember. I think it just really depends. Some people are really bothered by that. Other people just say, oh, he has a terrible memory, you know, that's just, Reminiscing isn't a thing we do together, right? I mean, it's just big deal. Uh, so, yeah. So it's really right. I really appreciate your morally forgiving stance. <laughs> <laughs> I'm ashamed. <laughs> so I wanted to uh, ask about the Strassen thing mm -hmm. because I had read it, mm -hmm. you know, and and I remember just brushing it off, thinking that either he's being disingenuous mm -hmm. or He's talking about something different when he labels himself as right. an episodic or whatever, whatever it was. Um, because I, I know people who are more or less cold, right? You, mm -hmm. you, you, you um, they have no feeling for nostalgia. You listen to mm -hmm. an old song or something like that, and they're just saying, eh. and, and I, I don't listen to that anymore. <laughs> yeah, and so, um, but now, um, 
does this new case mm -hmm. make you think differently about the Strawson objection? Well, yeah, I mean, so this case came to my attention because, you know, having written against Strawson, 10, literally 10 people sent me, have you seen this? Uh -huh. <laughs> have you seen this? And it's like, oh my goodness. Yeah. Well, I mean, he, I mean, they took it to vindicate him. Right. right. Because look, you know, here's, a, and so, and so I did have to take it because I, I felt the same way. I felt when he says he's episodic, all he means is like, look, some people like to collect little figurines and other people right. don't, yeah. right? It's yeah. LCD that he recognizes as his own in his works. And, right. But it, that might not. And, and I think, I mean, I don't really know what he means, but that's sort of what I felt is like, oh, you don't really mean you don't think it's you. You just mean. But what she, what this case made me think is, well, in what sense do, and I mean, this does go back to, to getting confused about episodic memory. Even, I, I mean, I am really prone to nostalgia and stuff like that, but then in, in what sense do I think that's me? Of course there are parts of my life where I'm like, yeah, you know, I know that happened. I mean, that was a long time ago or, you know, whatever. So... So what I'm, yeah, I think what I'm still trying to figure out is, is what are the different forms of experience here? And, and is it just a continuum or is there really some? And it, it seems to me deeply connected. So I do actually have more sympathy for Strassen and think that he might be, you know, I mean, I was chastised, so I, I did just dismiss him saying I'm an episodic because I was like, yeah, I don't know what you mean, or you're being disingenuous because you're still getting the royalties for the book and all of that. And, but, but at the same time, um, I was chastened by his saying, you know, what's true for you might not be true for everyone. There are many different ways in which people experience the world and, you know, this sort of introspection and saying this is how it is for people is a dangerous game. And, and that, I think, um, I took very much to heart, especially, you know, in light of this. But I was going to say, oh, what I was going to say is I think it, it's connected to another thing that I'm really interested in understanding, um, which is, you know, some people just have this very intense sense of history. You know, it's like I'm standing at the Acropolis. You know, I'm in the, you know, halls that Kant once walked. I'm, you know, looking at the, and then other people, you know, it's just, that's just not their thing. So, I mean, so part of the question is, that, I mean, to me, this feels like a very deep difference, but, but then, you know, some people like classical and some people like jazz and some, you know, I mean, maybe it's really, you know, some people are athletes and some people are philosophers. And so, so really, I mean, I do think that there's something more fundamental um, going on here, but exactly what it is is what I'm, yeah, still trying to. Um. I want to talk about something that stuck out to me towards like the first half mm -hmm. of your talk, how you were using the word remember. Mm -hmm. So um, at, at one point you were talking about McKinnon and how it didn't really seem to make sense that she could go home without remembering having ever gone home before, you know? Um, how could she have that home sweet home feeling? Right. And then you tried to make sense of it. Now correct me if I'm, you know, mm -hmm. uh, inaccurately recounting anything that you said. Um, you tried to make sense of it by saying, well, when I go home and when you guys go home, we don't really remember, oh yeah, I was, I was here before and this, this is where mm -hmm. I feel safe and this is where I go to sleep and okay, this is home for me. We don't really remember these things and this is how it works mm -hmm. pretty much everywhere that we go. But I'm not so sure if I'd be quick to agree with that because when you go somewhere that you haven't been before, you know that you haven't been there before because you don't remember having been there before. Mm -hmm. So when we go home, even though we're not actively recall, recalling memories, when we arrive at our front door, we do remember having been home. Right. So I don't know, are there two different ways of remembering or are you using it in a different way? How are we to make sense? Yeah, so I, I was being sloppy. So one way in which people tend to make the semantic episodic distinction or one way of trying to clarify it is to say, in, episode, in semantic memory, you remember that. I remember that I have been here before. I remember that my address is. 
And then what's natural, the natural locution for episodic memory is, I remember being here before. I remember, you know, when, when we were here last week or something. And that typically when we say things like, I remember when we were here last time, you don't just mean, I know that we have been here before, um, but that it's all coming back to me now. Yeah, there was that guy and, you know, the door was locked and you had to write that kind of thing. So it's, it's something specific. So it's true. I mean, the, the problem is, you know, there's so many different kinds of memory. She absolutely does remember having been there before in one sense. Um, and it's the same sense that, you know, if you take, when the dog walker comes to walk the dog and it's someone the dog knows, the dog is not thinking, oh yeah, this person was here last Thursday and she was really nice. Um, but nonetheless, in some sense, clearly remembers the person. And so, so, so I was not being very careful with my wording, but so what I meant was something like, you know, when I come home, I don't think, oh yeah, there was that time that I cooked that dinner and the, you know, I just, I'm home, Got right? It. So it's this other kind of memory, yeah. One final question, I think, then we really have to conclude, Luke. Um, I suppose my aim is to ask a primarily disambiguating question as it concerns specifically your discussion about the perspectival character of episodic memory mm -hmm. and the sense in which it affords a kind of evidence. And I'm interested in what it is that it affords evidence for in the sense in which it does afford evidence. So to begin, I suppose I was to say that um, your account seems to suggest that there's a, an incompleteness that is this characteristic of episodic memory in such a respect that as a function of introspecting in a reflective sort of mm -hmm. way about those memories, we recognize that they are the sorts of things that such that in any particular moment of reflective awareness, we don't plumb the depths as it were of our, our total character. Mm -hmm. That is something that's given over time. And so what I wonder is, the extent to which the kind of identity is to play here, which we have to be careful to note, is yeah. not necessarily the sort of identity that's equivalent to a broader sense, which would yeah. incorporate someone like McKinnon. Right. If you wanted to be somewhat more communicative about that. But to what extent is it phenomenologically opaque? What I mean by that is, so take, for instance, two different views, mm -hmm. broadly speaking, about the phenomenal structure of experience. On the one hand, and here I'm drawing a comparison with, say, Husserl, his talk about the construction of objects. So there's a sense in which, given in our pre-reflective experiences, are objects that we experience as unity, but we can introspectively reconstruct them in mm -hmm. terms of bringing into our awareness the fact that we don't see them, strictly speaking, as objects when we think about how it is that they're constituted. Rather, we recognize that we see them at any particular moment from a variety of different and somehow there's a creative construction that we can infer, but which we don't have experience of, mm -hmm. experience of objects. On the other hand, there's the sort of human skepticism about the self. You, know, you only ever see mm -hmm. particular, so to speak, you only ever have particular kinds of experiences. And so is it that identity is given in our perspectival experiences or that we rationally reconstruct them as perspectival moments? I want it to be the former. I mean, so I want it to be non-reflective. The idea is um, what the multi-perspectivalism does is, um, I mean, one way of putting it is because this is part of how we experience the world, the experience of now comes as an experience that is a temporary perspective of mine without my reflecting on it. I mean, it's just, that's how I experience the world. So, I mean, part of, and, and you know, maybe the thing would be clear if I had had time to do the stuff about, um, about what is and isn't lost with this because I mean one concern people always have is well wouldn't it be better if it didn't like 
you know, isn't that our problem? <laughs> Wouldn't we all be better off if we could just be in the moment and, and so on? Um, but my, I mean, my feeling there is, well, there is no, for, for beings like us who have this sort of multi-perspective, I mean, just, there is no just sort of being in the moment in the way that, like, presumably there is for the turtle or the bunny. Our experience in the moment is this complicated, multifaceted thing um, that, I don't know, I mean, I don't know Husserl, and, but if, if I, you know, had been raised in continental philosophy, I would say something about bringing its own temporariness with it or something, but I just, uh, but, but that is what I'm trying to express, yeah. Yeah. I think we've got to continue our conversation with Christian and Ryan. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.